Hi there. In this lecture, I am going to talk to you about a specific painting. We're going to kind of make a deep dive into the painting and discover what we can learn about a particular painting. So the painting here I want to go into is by Guo Xi, and it's called Early Spring, painted in 1072, and it was painted with India ink or black ink, carbon ink on silk. So that's why it has that warm glow about it. It is currently in the National Palace Museum, Taipei. Now Guo Xi was a scholar official. He was not a professional painter. He didn't paint for a living. He painted as a part of kind of cultivation of being a part of the literary elite. It was sort of expected that you have and cultivate these artistic skills and abilities, calligraphy, painting, poetry, and many other uh, kinds of skills that these scholar officials uh, cultivated as a way in which they were able to achieve patronage and give gifts and exchange a kind of intellectual banter that was necessary for advancement in their official careers. So this painting, even though it was done by what we really is an amateur, he didn't pay, someone didn't pay him for this painting, it was given away as a gift. And it was to be a, a tremendous gift, a gift that would um, implicate a kind of expectation of some sort of reciprocity in the, the person who would receive it. And this is how the sort of gift exchange uh, went on for centuries. And the people who owned these paintings, they took great pride in them. They would then re-gift them to other important people. And famous paintings would slowly migrate up into the highest collections and be uh, part of the, you know, the part of the emperor's personal collection. And we see that um, the emperor of the Qianlong dynasty was enabled to possess this and he made an inscription on the painting, which we'll talk about later. And so one of the other things we know about these paintings is that it would be displayed on a suitable occasion that it wouldn't just be hanging on the wall for anyone to see all the time. It would be brought out and on a certain term. And now this painting is uh, entitled Early Spring. So it seems that a very likely situation would be on such a date in the early spring, someone who came to visit might be treated to uh, display the painting and it would be hung for their personal enjoyment on that occasion. And so the way in which these paintings were appreciated were in these very controlled situations where people would then be asked to comment on them. And if you were an especially an important person, you might be asked to even sign the painting or write an inscription on it. And this is the way in which these paintings passed down uh, along through the centuries. Now, the spiritual core of this painting is the, is the mountain. We've talked a great deal already about how mountains are a kind of Taoist spiritual idea, but they also have a kind of important resonance in Confucianism, and they also have a kind of Buddhist ideas as well. In this, uh, we see a, a poem, The great mountain, awesome and dignified, is the lord of many mountains. Therefore lay out the parts of nature, separating them according to order, ridges, hills, forests, and ravines. So there's a looks like a jumble of a sort of chaotic landscape, uh, a jumble, but to the keen eye, there is an underlying unity and order and a sense of this is the natural order of things. And that natural order reflects the Confucian order and that the cultivated person meditating on this landscape, in a sense, goes on a spiritual journey and experiences its harmonies and it, painting essentially brings peace to the viewer. So we see in this landscape not only these mountains and trees 
uh, and, and tremendous rocks, we also see uh, people, and the people are tiny and insignificant, much like the painting um, by Fan Quan, Travelers Amid Rocks and Streams. We can see uh, people uh, on their boats coming ashore in near the base, and they're they're small personalities, just kind of dwarfed by these magnificent uh, monumental. Uh, mountains. Further along, we see travelers, people who are entering and beginning their journey upward into the mountain. You can see how they are carrying packages uh, as if for a, a long journey. They've traveled from the city. They're moving into the countryside. And it's sort of an, a movement of sort of on this pilgrimage, a, a kind of this journey. We talked about the Buddhist implications of this but also this idea of the Confucian scholar who is on a retreat, who is sort of leaving the city behind, uh, like the scholars of the bamboo grove, finding refuge in nature. Here are more villagers, people who are uh, going about their daily lives, sort of setting the scene that we are in this kind of deep wilderness area where rural people, you know, eke out a living. Uh, further up along the slope there, you see uh, the one example of a scholar. You can tell by his long brimmed hat that he has a pair of guides who are helping uh, haul his goods to a sanctuary, which is where he is headed. And the sanctuary is over on the far right edge of the picture, a rather simple um, pagoda, a place uh, where a weary travel might rest. And then further up, we see more travelers on their journey into this rack, craggy ravine. Now let's talk about the landscape they're moving through, uh, which in one stage seems very vivid and very real, and in other places very uh, ephemeral and very uh, sort of uh, indistinct. Now here in the, in the center is an especially sort of chaotic view of towering mountains and rocks kind of coming together and pulling apart in this kind of overabundant manner. Now the thing that makes this picture especially uh, disorienting to some is the way in which you think you're seeing something at one particular vantage point but then if your eye moves to another place, it, the vantage point seems to have changed. And this is a unique feature of this particular painting that was developed by Guo Xi. And he called this the angle of totality. And that uh, instead of having like in perspective, where you have a kind of fixed view of a single point looking into the landscape, here, if you are looking up into the composition, you're seeing the mountains as if you're looking up at them. And then if we look into the environment, we are looking straight at it. Our vantage point is straight ahead. And then if we tilt our eye down to look at the, the foreground, it is as if we are sort of hovering above it. And so this kind of different shifting latitudes of, of perspective Give us the sense that we are deeply immersed in this landscape, which towers above us and hovers below us. Now, Guo Xi is the man, who, as I said, who invented this. And this would become a way in which landscape paintings were no longer kind of a single image, but became more and more a kind of composite of various mountains brought together to create this sort of angle of totality. Now let's look more closely at the trees that populate, especially the lower uh, grounds. In the foreground we have uh, two very prominent trees standing almost upright, uh, and next to them are some twisted branches. Guo Xi used trees as a way to make commentary on human beings. So the trees were, in a sense, examples of exemplary people. And the tall trees are people who flourish in adversity. 
people who have the ability to uh, take difficult uh, situation and bring it to their advantage. And the other trees we see, which are lower down, more gnarled, more twisted, these are people who are clinging to their values, who struggle to hold on to what they believe is true and right. And these are evergreen trees, and so they send that sense of persistence, that sense of being and maintaining one's values, regardless of the season. Now let's look more closely at the brushwork in these paintings. You notice that it's a kind of twisting, searching line, this sinuous line that moves backwards and forwards. Um, it's broken up. There's very little that's a clear, straight line. This kind of organic, twisting form pushes one way, then another, to create this kind of um, movement and drama within it. And each one of these smaller branches also echoes this sort of larger idea of twisting themes. It's as he has a way of painting nature. He's trying to express this idea of movement in the branches by approaching both the way the rocks and the trees are painted creates a kind of unity of the way the brushstrokes are moving. Also, we see in this uh, areas that are given focus through a kind of circular composition. Our eye moves up and then the branches move down and we come back to create this kind of circular space in the composition, which is further subdivided, as you can see, by this rock, which kind of sinuously breaks into the scene in this kind of twisting S-curve, this kind of yin and yang idea of things in motion. This S-curve is a theme that you can find in various parts of this composition and is also what makes up the larger composition as a whole, this kind of giant S that kind of breaks up and moves across the form. So you see in this painting, in the macrocosmic and in the microcosmic, there is this powerful unity. Now, if you've been looking at this painting, as I have for a while, you're probably wondering what these red marks are. And you're, you're, you're right in trying to understand that they are a different kind of language than what we've seen in the sort of handwritten calligraphy. They are stamps. They're stamped in. They're seals. They are people's proper names. And this is a way in which that the... Um, People who have owned the picture or people who have been invited to um, admire the picture may have also included their stamps. And so every time we look at a painting from the ancient past, these stamps give us a sense of who was there to look at this, who uh, appraised it. Now, the placement of the stamps is very important. The way in which someone would demonstrate their uh, understanding of the painting and their admiration for its unique qualities would be by where they put their stamps. And of course, the larger the stamp, the more impressive the person would be. And so you see the very large stamp up there in the top. That would be the emperor's own uh, bow or chop, which is his signature, showing that this was something he puts it very prominent right at the top. No one can put a seal in a more prominent place than the emperor. So there's a kind of status to where you place your stamp. As I mentioned before, uh, in the 18th century, this painting was inscribed by Emperor Chen Long. Uh, the signature of the artist is over on the far left portion of the composition. Now, the, the fact that the emperor felt the need to actually write something on the composition is something of a, of a kind of bold statement of ownership. This is uh, important, and I am a cultured person, and I can appreciate this work with my beautiful calligraphy. And so there's a kind of a sense of ownership and, and a sense also of trying to kind of possess this in a very important way. Now, the politics of this are a little complicated. The 18th century emperor Qianlong 
was not a Han emperor. He was a Manchu uh, emperor. And so he's trying to show that he has what it is the knowledge and the culture and erudition to appreciate such a fine work as this, and that his knowledge is demonstrated by his calligraphy. Here is what he writes in the inscription. The trees are just about to sprout. Leaves, the frozen brook begins to melt. There is nothing between the willow and peach trees to clutter up the scene. Steam-like mist can be seen early in the morning on the springtime mountain. This is not a terribly remarkable statement. It doesn't really add anything to our understanding of the painting. Um, it's more important that who it was and when it was made uh, and why it was done to the painting. And in this way, it's like other ancient objects that have been used as symbols of status, like we mentioned earlier, this jade blade that also has an inscription on it from this period, um, this later period, is a way of kind of reinscribing and kind of possessing these objects in a way that allows them to become something of meaning and value in the present, that their meaning and value is nebulous uh, until they are sort of given a specific role in the new empire. Let's have our review quiz. To begin with, question one, how does scale in the landscape painting communicate Taoist ideas? Question two, how does the painting communicate the idea of a journey and why is that important? Question three, what different kinds of texts can be found on the landscape and what is their purpose? How does the composition and perspective change across the whole landscape? Question 5. Who would look at this painting, and on what kind of an occasion would it be seen? 